Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, let me echo Leah's welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Omar Abosh, Accenture's Chief Executive for our comms, media, and technology clients. Uh, and uh, we're here today to talk about this topic of trust. Uh, now, trust uh, sometimes may feel like a bit of a nebulous topic. Uh, and just uh, talking with my colleagues here on the panel earlier, you know, I was reminded of the late 1990s where people didn't trust to put their credit card details on the internet. Uh, but at some point that changed, and this giant market called e-commerce exploded and, and became what we, what we see today. Um, in reality, though, the, the real application of the internet and all its associated technologies and business are in the early stage. So e-commerce is still a relatively small part of global retail, uh, and in the internet has hardly penetrated into healthcare, insurance, industrial, and many other sectors. And um, the research that Accenture has published in the last couple of days uh, on the state of trust in the digital economy basically is saying, look, if you go back 10 years, only 25% of companies would have used the internet genuinely in their business operations. Today, 100% of companies use the internet in their business operations, and they're increasing that. The challenge for CEOs, though, and I joke a little bit, caught between a rock and a hard place, is on the one hand, if a CEO and, and the company doesn't innovate fast enough, they, re they risk getting left behind. But on the other hand, if they innovate too quickly, they risk the erosion of trust because they're putting technologies and innovations in traffic that they cannot secure. And in fact, the evidence from the research says that that is indeed the problem, uh, that we're erring on the side of going a bit too fast today, uh, where uh, people are putting trust at risk. And we think that the future value for business and society is too high uh, to play that risk. So what we'd like to do today is talk to you about the state of trust today, what organizations, governmental and, uh, and business can do about it, and then some concrete actions. Um, and I couldn't think of a better panel than this excellent collection I have uh, here with me today, representing business, government, and law enforcement. So Jean-Pascal Tricoir is the CEO of Schneider Electric. Uh, and Agnès Pannier-Runacher is the minister, let me get this exactly right, the Secretary of State for the Minister of Finance and Economy from France, if you couldn't get that from my attempt at French there. Uh, and uh, Jürgen Stock is the Secretary General of Interpol, um, the, the, the organizing body of all the police federations around the world. Uh, and so we're going to just dive into the topic. We'll have a conversation amongst ourselves and then invite the audience to join us uh, at an appropriate moment. So Jean-Pascal. Schneider Electric is engaged in uh, creating incredible technology for businesses, for companies, to sensorize commercial operations, industrial plants. You're putting more and more software into those facilities and those capabilities. Uh, your ecostructure fabric is world leading in terms of what you're doing. How do you think about uh, the state of trust today and what Schneider is doing about it? That's, uh, while preparing for this panel, I, I was thinking that it's a very uh, complicated matter, right? Uh, at the end of the day, trust, or at the beginning of the day, trust is the base of everything we do in business. The way you, people speak about processes, about controls, but every day we trust our customers, we trust our suppliers, and we trust our people because the base of a company is to delegate. Some people think that the company is a series of signature and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's all based on trust uh, between people. Uh, what we do at Schneider is to supply energy and automation, digital solutions for better efficiency and sustainability. So therefore, uh, it's, it's pretty much the foundation of many of our customer solutions. And we speak about digital, but thinking about the subjects, I mean, uh, there was not much trust in non-digital systems. Right? Uh, uh, the systems we are breaking and you didn't know it, you couldn't prevent it. 30% um, still today of the <coughs> public service outages in the world are due to power outages that were not prevented because things, by the way, were not connected. Uh, if you got one hour of interruption in a production line, automotive, whatever, it's in million, six million, seven million, ten million. Normally, when I get a call from a CEO, it's coming from that. Uh, in most of the cases, we are not responsible, they call us for help. Okay. So you can't say that the old system is really, uh, is, is really physical, non-connected, is, uh, is trustworthy. Therefore, in our sector, already for 30 years, we've been connected. 
We've been connected because it brings traceability. It enables to do predictive maintenance. You start to see the things drifting uh, before they happen, and you can prevent problems uh, uh, to happen. The new new thing somewhere is the fact that the connected is getting connected. So it's the hyper-connectivity of the world, the usage of the internet, which brings somewhere three problems as I see it today. The first point is that your data that used to be on-premise with a kind of uh, naive belief that it is impregnable because it's on-premise, right, is getting duplicated somewhere. So sometimes it's just a set of data, logs of data, SCADA, that kind of thing, but it can be a full digital twin of your installation. So there, there is a question of privacy what we experience as individuals when somebody holds our stuff is true for your factory, it can be true for your home, it can be true for your building. So that's the first, first problem. The second problem is a problem of entry point, connectivity, right? What used to be on-premise and so-called isolated uh, is in fact now getting connected to the internet and people are, and we are all shit scared that somebody will enter uh, uh, this way, right? And the third problem probably is a new topic of AI, where now machines are learning about you and you don't know what they learn uh, on the base of digital. And there is a problem of ethics of machines, right? Uh, so that's the third point which I see as a, as a subject which is creating a problem of trust. But at the end, and, and I won't answer your question, but do we have the choice? Because, okay, you have risks, but look at the, the, uh, the advantages, average, 25% energy efficiency, 30% on your OPEX, 30% on your CAPEX design. Preventive maintenance, you see the problems before they happen and you can prevent them. So the elevator is not stopping, the room is not in the dark, your production is not, uh, is not in the dark. Traceability of the people who have interacted, because before when problems happen, you don't know what provoked it. In this case, uh, you will get, uh, you will get uh, a, a traceability of the things. So it's weighing risk and benefits, but everybody is rushing to it. And, and I would finish by saying on the top of it, I believe that the new hyperconnectivity is safer than the insulation. Because most of the problem we saw in the past were not coming through the internet, they were coming through a USB <coughs> key, an infected PC, a guy come in who had played with his kids over the weekend, got his PC infected, that created a Trojan horse or anything and you didn't see anything. So it's like security in the cities, I don't know what Jürgen will tell us, either you make barriers across your city or you put people who monitor what's going wrong in the city. And I think what we see today is that it's more about monitoring what's going malicious, what's going wrong, than believing quite naively that a wall is existing around your company. So that's how I see it. So what is the state of trust? People are embarking because the benefits are huge and we are all working to elevate the monitoring of the installations as we go forward. You, you remind me as you speak, Jean-Pascal, actually I'm looking at Lee here of the energy sector where um, there's lots of doubts about connection, but actually uh, security of supply and electricity and gas is enforced by more interconnection, not less interconnection. So there are some interesting yeah. parallels there. Uh, but okay, so Schneider is on the mission of we're going to exploit this technology and use it for the benefit of society and business, but what we're wide open, our eyes are wide open to some of the issues that we now need to mitigate and address. Okay, okay. so Agnès, um, uh, President Macron had a very bold and, and courageous call around the Paris Accord for cybersecurity. Could you tell us a little bit about what you and the government were thinking about that and what you want to achieve with regards to trust, please? Well, um, so as uh, Jean-Pascal mentions, uh, there are some risks attached to uh, this cyberspace. Uh, the, ri the risks are not only on the business, but it's also on the conversations we are all having around the world and sometimes on the how do you, uh, how, where is truth and what is not true. And it's also an issue for democracy. And uh, it's uh, clearly an issue for all, all democracies. And, and the fact is, as of today, uh, when you speak of the physical space, you know more or less, we all know how to use this physical space. We know that we can get abused, we know that we can get robbed, but in fact, we will not go in a dodgy neighborhood at two o'clock in the evening because we know where are the risks. When it comes to cyberspace, uh, I think we are maybe uh, not uh, knowledgeable enough, uh, maybe naive, you mentioned the point, and maybe the fact that we are all interconnected will help because we will uh, um, be more uh, knowledgeable about the cyberspace, but taking that into account, we have to act. 
And we cannot act as governments alone because cyberspace don't know any borders, don't borders, don't know any specific rules, and we have to acknowledge that this is a, a space where we have to have a more collaborative approach to set some uh, uh, collaborative rules, and that we have all. Uh, um, the, the, the companies, the governments, uh, and uh, even uh, uh, civil society, a responsibility. So this is what is at stake with the Paris call of the 12th of November. It is to say, we should have the same rights offline than online. This is basic, basic, but this is not the case as of today. And we should work all together in a collaborative way, and everybody is responsible for what is at stake at the cyberspace. It's not only a question of government, it's not only a question of companies who may have uh, more technology or whatever, that would be uh, clearly a deadlock, and it's also a, a question of citizenship. And through this uh, Paris call, we want to uh, make an awareness. Uh, I, uh, I've got a, a boss who told me years ago, if you want to address an issue, you have to make it visible. So we make the issue visible, and we say there is a, a, a way to address it. We, we, we put it on the table on G7, on G20, on the Air World Economic Forum. We don't want to have a specific forum to address it. We just want to say we need to cooperate. We need to say we have a responsibility in it. And we want to embark everybody to work on that and to find some solutions that will be moving solutions, we are aware. But clearly, um, this is a way to, to set the discussion and to set the move. Perfect. Uh, th thank you, Anya. So, and again, You've set my brain wondering about you know, digital identity. One of the issues with, um, so elevating a common understanding of cyber issues I think is great and super important. Um, but one of the big differences between online and offline is anonymity. Uh, in online, if you speak up in a way that your, the, so your social environment don't like, they tell you, they signal it. Offline, uh, that doesn't happen. And so there's some things for us to, to think about how we may tackle those. So, so Jürgen, you, you represent uh, the federation of all the police agencies around the world, helping almost all, uh, uh, well, 194, <laughs> uh, yeah, 194 countries. So it's a lot of police uh, groups, uh, and and you help provide the infrastructure to connect them to help fight crime in the 21st century. So tell us a little bit about about your high tech infrastructure and what you're doing to help manage uh, increasing trust. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for for having a global law enforcement uh, on that panel. Um, of course, we we consider that our role. Um, in fighting cybercrime, but the same applies for terrorism, organized crime, because very often these phenomena are linked with each other in, um, in supporting prosecutions, investigations, um, so to ensure that there is no safe haven for any kind of criminal activity, uh, but also for the prevention piece. Um, and uh, I think trust is a, is a very interesting concept and, of course, very important for policing. But, I mean, I represent a very diverse community um, of 194 member countries' police services, some of them conducting on a regular basis um, public surveys on trust. And, and we know that, for instance, here in Switzerland, in France, in my home country, Germany, currently the police is, is ranking very high in, in public trust. So in some countries, it's the number one. So even higher considered as constitutional courts, politicians, uh, and, and other societal groups. So uh, trust is definitely a, a very important category for, for law enforcement. But more important, perhaps, for no, not more, not more important, equally important is to having, having a clear set of rules and regulations. Because I think trust is also based on transparency with regards to what police is doing, actually. Um, so providing transparency, for instance, in handling sensitive data, sensitive information. And uh, um, I was wondering, you know, that cybercrime is one of these extremely underreported crimes. So currently we do not have really a clear understanding what the global landscape looks like with regard to cybercrime. I can, could tell you a lot about international terrorism and organized crime groups operating globally on environmental crime, drug trafficking. In terms of cyber, of course, we, we all re recall these, these wake-up calls like WannaCry, not Petya. Uh, my home country, Germany, had an incident a couple of days ago almost where there was a big disruption, which, I mean, the, 
investigations are still going on, but it seems that it was somebody who years ago would have called a script kitty, still living in uh, his mother's and father's basement and, and uh, causing a data breach um, concerning more than 1,000 politicians, journalists, and, and everybody. So uh, not a high-profile criminal, perhaps, perhaps, uh, but causing a major disruption. Um, so, so we know these cases. <coughs> And the, the consequences have been the, the, the same. So we, 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 or the Germans understood cyber hygiene is still an issue. So what does it mean in terms of the, the category of trust? Are people, if they use the password, one, two, three, four, five, six, or I love you, do they, they trust nothing will happen? Or is it just, is it ignorance? Or is it, what is that? Or uh, I, I don't know exactly. Um, so, and why is it that only maybe two, three, four percent of all the incidents that are taking place are reported to the police? Because we all want to make sure that the internet is not becoming a kind of no-go area, that nobody trusts the internet as a, as a, a platform for communication and as a platform for, 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 um, for business. So, uh, I think law enforcement and ensuring that uh, cyber criminals are, get, are, be, are, are brought behind bars is one important component beside prevention. So why is it that every bank, for instance, has a, has a red button uh, that in case that there's a bank robbery, I mean, it's, it's almost dying out. Nobody is conducting bank robbery anymore because the cyber is much easier. But why is it that, that every bank has a, such a red button which they push immediately in case uh, an incident occurs? And in the cyber arena, obviously, first of all, it takes still statistically 150 days to become aware that they have been breached. And secondly, if they become aware, they do something but not informing the police. So why is it? Is it a category of trust? Because they do not exactly know what the police is doing in such an incident. They don't know whether the prosecutor is shutting down the company or pulling the plugs and, and seizing all the computers and the, the, the business is, is collapsing for, for some time. Uh, is it because they do not trust in our abilities to investigate that kind of crime on a global level? And of course, that maybe should conclude my introductory remarks by saying uh, global law enforcement in its diversity has in the recent years been successful in conducting cyber investigations. Uh, we all know the example of some of the major darknet marketplaces, uh, Alpha Bay, uh, Hansa market, which were uh, taken down. We know some of the botnet incidents, uh, so denial of service attacks where botnets have been taken down by, by at least those law enforcement agencies that have the capability and the trained staff at that stage, and those who have been establishing a good and close cooperation with the private sector. That is key. That also has something to do with uh, trust. Uh, we, we, we are, I think we, we, Davos is a great trust-building exercise for all of us, the convening power of the World Economic Forum. But again, I would say having clear rules and regulations is equally important that people uh, or, or trust comes from the existence of clear rules and regulations, from transparency, that everybody understands what is global law enforcement doing with the information I provide, what happens if I enter into a collaboration with uh, Interpol, for instance, on developing cyber security related solutions, developing tools, what, what, what exactly is law enforcement doing? And I think we have to be much better in explaining that to the public and we have to be much better in setting up new institutionalized forms of partnership. What I'm doing here every day now, every hour and today here, inviting representatives of companies like Accenture, for instance, in, in, in joining our desk by desk approach where, where um, international law enforcement teams, joint investigation teams are sitting together with private sector people under a strict set of rules and regulations and trying to create preventive powers and, and trying to successfully investigate cyber crime. So uh, a very interesting concept, the concept of trust, but equally important is that we all understand what's going on, have clear rules and regulations in place, which is difficult on a global scale, because of course we are talking about a global phenomena which requires a global com comprehensive, well-coordinated uh, approach. Yeah, I mean, if I am, um, I'm just going to reflect a little bit on the last comments you made, Jürgen, and then come around to, to talk about, well, what should we be doing? But the, the um, so when you ask the question about why do businesses not immediately declare uh, what's going on, you know, in, a, in the case of a breach that they half know about? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so I'll tell you what I hear from my clients. The, the, in some cases, the law enforcement agencies do indeed show up with muddy boots stamping around the house, uh, you know, making a mess without thinking about, you know, what does it really mean for the business? Uh, in other cases, the standards 
that we have established in other domains, like you know, benzene gets into my mineral water, or you know, my brakes are not functioning so well, and I do a mass product recall. Those standards where people know how to handle those crises, yeah. that hasn't established itself yet in the cybersphere. And so, so, so I mean, those are some of the reasons, if you like, mm. why mm. there may be some hesitancy. So, as I listen to the three of you, uh, more transparency, uh, more collaboration, uh, more education, so that people understand clearly can be enormously helpful, and, and we all need to play our role in helping make more of that happen. Mm. Um, if I uh, come around a little bit, uh, Jean-Pascal, and um, you talked upstairs about the fact that you know, computing is leaving the, the naively protected data center, and it's not just gone to the cloud, but in fact, it'll go to the edge. Uh, and in a world of tens of billions, depending on whose numbers you look at, hundreds of billions of connected devices, uh, you know, intelligence and data will be stored at you know a, a vastly broader array than where we see today. So, so what is how does Schneider thinking about securing that kind of an environment, and uh, how do you think about the trust issues that you will confront going forward? Well, we are obsessed by it. Um, well, there, there are two two points that we need to secure. The first one is our systems at the customer. We have to secure our customers' systems, which is. The first, uh, the first priority, and then there is the second one, which is securing our own company, right? And they are not exactly, uh, exactly the same. But uh, focusing probably on, uh, by the way, coming back on what you are mentioning, uh, the, one of the reasons why companies take time to go back to uh, police, uh, you need time to understand. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you don't know exactly where it comes from, where, how it is. And, and at least when there was a bank robber, it was a bad guy with a gun in front of you. Uh, sometimes a cyber thing is coming two or three steps and you need to understand a little bit and we work sometimes with people like you to, to establish that but it takes, uh, it takes time. Now back to my subject, what, what is at least on our side our principle. The first thing is really make a mapping of the risks because you can elevate defenses, I like this on this part of your systems if you have no defense in that sensor, in that actuator or that part of the software uh, there is no point to have a wall high level. So we do scenario afterwards. Um, uh, there is, you, you have to put in those uh, jobs people with a LC level of paranoia, which is uh, so that they're always imagining the, the worst uh, possible. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second point is that clearly everything which is around cyber protection in R&D budget and allocation has been ramping very, very fast. And one thing that I'm looking at is making sure the, the advantage of being a 25 billion euro company is that we, with a lot of R&D, is to have enough mass behind the, uh, uh, the R&D. Um, develop platforms. There used to be a time where people say I have to experiment fast. I, everybody is doing his own subsystem enough. So the funny thing is that digital is that funny package of um, testing very fast on the market, so doing fast initiative, but at the same time, big discipline on the backbone of your system so that you can mutualize, coalize, and that everybody benefits from, uh, from what you are doing. Uh, in our sector, which is connecting products to control systems on the edge, to uh, analytics, duplicating on the cloud, end-to-end uh, -end design. Uh, it was easy to manage a company in our sector 15 years ago when everybody was doing a product which we are not talking to each other. Uh, today, much more complicated. And, and it's in terms of leadership, and it's uh, having this environment where you cultivate on one side um, a full compliance sense of discipline, and at the same time, the spirit to try things fast is, is a complicated thing. And it's a balance of, uh, of every moment. What else could I say? Alliances. Um, the whole industry is working on securing systems. Personally, I say to my teams, never develop something that somebody else is doing in a much larger quantity. There has been this crazy belief when digital was born that everybody could develop his own technology. Well, nothing has changed. There is still an effect of scale, right? Yeah. And the people who are very good at a secured cloud are very good at a secured cloud. People who are very good at data acquisition and algorithm are very good at that. Nothing has changed. There is no walking on the water, flying of the, to the sky. It's, it's exactly the same. So we are working with, uh, in a close manner with selected uh, strong partners with whom that we trust uh, to help us building higher defenses and we would do it in another, in another way. We work with, um, with uh, uh, people like Interpol or the, there are countries uh, where we operate as 
uh, it's not our country of origin on, on what we, we love that the agencies, the local agencies are really considering us as partners. Mm -hmm. So not only you watch your system, but those people watching all the time the net, they tell you we've seen that there may be something malicious happening and we work together in resolving things. So it's not only technology, but working with, uh, with the whole ecosystem. And finally, uh, training people, uh, because really you want everybody to be on that side very compliant, that there is no sense, there is zero tolerance in doing funky things and forgetting to be trained on the latest things on cybersecurity. That's how I would put it. The last thing, and you said it, I think the duty of, uh, of a company is to be transparent. Shit happens uh, because there are multiple attacks. Uh, good thing is that first finger, touch monkey skin, so far systems react well, but at the same time you call the customer and say, there has been this problem, we are working on it, we work on it together, but you have to be super transparent on what, this is a base of trust, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the zero problem environment never exists. It was not existing in the physical world. It's not existing in the digital world. But you trust people who speak uh, true uh, to you. Right. That, that was great, uh, Jean-Pascal. And uh, actually, as Jean-Pascal speaking, he reminds me of uh, my longtime boss who very recently stepped down as the chairman and CEO of Accenture, Pierre Nantem, who had a phrase of, call a cat a cat. So I think we just got a bit of that uh, experience here. So merde happens. Uh, it's, good, it's good to know. Yeah. Uh, it's a, probably a global phenomenon that we need to deal with. The, 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 um, uh, I mean Jean-Pascal, actually, in the research, one of the things that came out is that what all the, the 1,700 executives we spoke to said is that one of the hardest things they're finding to secure nowadays is third parties in their supply chain. So 80% of companies are saying that's one of the hardest things to grapple with is how to establish standards for security in the supply chain that are not not where many companies have grown up, so it's something to... Uh, uh, so another point is work a lot on standards together, on the interfaces to make sure you secure the point of junction yeah. uh, between your company. At the same time, you learn a lot from the others. It's always easy, people believe it's always easy to work by yourself. Actually, when you work with other companies, it forces to clean the interfaces, and normally it makes you more secure. And actually, on, on that last point, I was very heartened in the research that the vast majority of executives said that no company is big enough to handle this issue alone. So everyone recognizes the need to connect and collaborate, as you said, with the threat intelligence groups and all the various industry bodies uh, around security. As you well understood, Accenture has convinced us here to convince you that you need them to secure yourself. <laughs> but, and, and by the way, Kelly Vissel, well, who runs Accenture just Security, to be is in the back of the room. Yeah. I mean, if, if, I, if I may, yeah. may, yeah. may edit to that Please, point, yeah. Cu currently we do not have a, have a global early warning mechanism in place. I mean, that's also a lesson that we all were able to learn after WannaCry, after yeah. NotPetya, yeah. that information was available at that time. Yeah. Some companies were using this information information, but it was not, not shared because such a mechanism doesn't e exist and it still doesn't exist. So we have certs in place, we have sometimes on, on a national level there's a lot going on, so sometimes but rarely on a, on a regional level, but we really need to set up a global early warning system against this threat. Mm -hmm. And again, no country, no company, no country, no region can do that in <coughs> isolation. Yeah. So that also maybe requires, yes, trust and commitment to build that collaboration. And I think the, the um, Center for um, Cybersecurity that was set up here under the auspices of the WEF is, a, is another good opportunity for the private sector and linked to global law enforcement through Interpol. But it also requires the lawmakers um, to help us setting up this regulatory framework and that framework on setting up clear SOPs in case something happens, what is the way to alarm the community very, very quickly? Because we, we know from WannaCry a lot of the damage could have been prevented with a proper global mechanism that uh, urgently needs to be developed. Yeah. And you know, regular patching would help as well. But I, I, yes, I, I, I simple as agree. it is. Yeah, I, I, I can. That's I, not enough. Yeah. We, we yeah, also absolutely. need the, the sharing the and transparency, as, as it was mentioned. Yeah. Just to give you an example, as I was a, a former deputy CEO, uh, we have some uh, uh, cyber uh, approach to, to, to see where we are our weaknesses and uh, uh, what we have to improve. And in fact, we see that uh, there was a weakness through a supplier and from our, uh, uh, so our company uh, IT, you can go through a supplier and go to another company. 
So it was not a weakness affecting in or yeah. affecting us, uh, but it was affecting others. one of uh, the big, uh, <laughs> you know, listed company in France, yeah. and was very surprised. And of course, we we, oh. we make the communication extra, but. That means that uh, sharing the information, collaboration, transparency are absolutely key. And coming back to basic, one uh, another example, uh, when we launched all the uh, uh, cyber security, uh, GPDR, I uh, was in a, uh, on the market uh, sharing uh, uh, information on the customers, we, we tracked the fact that some people uh, from the executive management uh, uh, have some information on the net was, that was for sale. So we just communicate on that. And the executive in my team was not aware that their own data was for sale on the net. And it changes completely what was supposed to be an abstract approach, you know, the customer, GPDR, constraints, uh, headache, whatever. It becomes very personal because there were uh, attacks in their own integrity. And I uh, think that in education, there is a very basic thing to do, which is to educate your uh, people, the, 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 your employees, also to be uh, able to tackle uh, the cyberspace security as citizen, that is to know what are the main uh, you know, uh, ways to uh, uh, misuse the information, to uh, educate them as customers, and to educate them as professionals, because they will have a 360 uh, degree approach, and that make them much better professional and much better, you know, uh, citizens and uh, and customers. And I think this is what is also at stake. Very basic approach. That's perfect, Agnes. Thank you. Uh, uh, and everything you're saying resonates with me a lot. The, the, I think one of the, the realizations that society is coming to is you don't have to be rich and famous to get hacked. Uh, and in fact, the cost of a hack is super cheap and automated. Uh, and so the kind of education you're talking about is required of every citizen yeah. uh, who, wa who wants to look after themselves and their family. So, um, so Jürgen, what would you ask of business in terms of better collaboration with law enforcement? What are the sorts of things that you're really after for the next level of evolution to help ensure more trust? Um, from, from, from organizing collaboration, on, on meetings like that, say, ah, oh, there is a there is a nice potential partner. Let's do something together, which I mean, very often is the, the basis for good work, good collaboration. Entering into a more institutionalized um, collaboration and also accepting perhaps some risks in terms of um, what is the perception, what is uh, maybe reputational risks uh, around that, and uh, or what's the return on investment. Um, I think uh, what is required in, 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 in light of the dimension of the threat, and the dimension of the threat will only increase um, during the next couple of years as the world is continuing being hyper-connected. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite clear that this provides unprecedented opportunities for criminals of all kind to attack uh, our systems. So the threat will increase, but to, ins to, to institutionalize on a national level, on a regional level, on a global level, a well-organized and coordinated cooperation amongst the, the business sectors. So maybe, I don't know, the, the, the um, critical infrastructures, um, any kind of industry amongst themselves, which very often already exists, but sharing across the different businesses and building the bridge between business and public sector. The many agencies that are now res responsible for cybersecurity issues, specialized agencies in some countries already plenty of sometimes on a, on a local level, on a state level, on a federal level. So there's a complex architecture of security. And if we do not coordinate this activity properly, we open the door for vulnerabilities. So we, we need to develop that architecture of security and we have to enter into a new institutionalized way of cooperating in a, in a planned way, in a strategic way with the private sector. So again, we, we try to do that on a small scale in our Interpol Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore, where we have at least currently 15 companies that have been seconding staff into the center based on clear rules and regulation to which information they have access and not, and working on security solutions and also supporting investigations. And the next step might be developing a, a joint incidents response teams that helps in terms of a crisis to immediately helping finding the answers that business continues but on the other hand, we can mitigate um, the impact 
of, of an attack. So institutional cooperation with the private sector on a national, regional, and global level. That's, I think, what we further need to develop. Okay. I mean, so you've put lots of thoughts, I think, in, in everyone's mind here. I'd like to come to the audience and open up a bit and get your perspectives. Just, just before I do, Leah, will, Leah, will you give me the five-minute warning? Because so, it's not just me that's been exhausted by Davos. It's my watch conked out a little bit earlier. So, uh, so, <laughs> so, that, so that, that would have 12 seconds. Maybe uh, yeah. just a word yeah, also yeah. on and the yeah. government yeah. approach. I believe that the government has to lead and impulse the debate, and uh, I completely uh, agree with you, and this is clearly what is at stake in the Paris call. We had to pull and analyze the knowledge and then to be able to frame the rules. But mm -hmm. if we want to frame the rules, we need to, to, to frame it based on evidence, and the evidence comes from the companies. So there is clearly a, a need for collaboration, and. I, I launch a call. Uh, I mean, it, please do not hesitate to, to embark in the Paris call and to work with us because we would like to make some proposals, an agenda and proposals for the coming year to know how we can move forward and uh, uh, settle the foundations of the regulations that is pragmatic but efficient. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm.